Just before we get started with today's video, I want to thank Brilliant for sponsoring it. To support Today I Found Out and learn more about Brilliant, go to brilliant.org slash today I found out and sign up for free. As we've covered in great detail in our video, what is the best way to survive falling out of a plane with no parachute? While there are ways to maximize your chance of surviving such an event, in most cases, when humans fall from more than about 30 feet or about 9 meters, the majority of times what will happen is your family and friends will get together shortly thereafter in your honor, but you're unable to attend because you're dead. But what about domestic house cats? How far can our feline friends take a tumble from and survive? Well, it turns out, assuming they don't suffocate, say, if you drop them from 40,000 feet and that they land on relatively flat grounds, nothing pointy or anything like that, there's a very good chance that they'll actually survive the event. How? Well, it turns out a typical domestic cat's terminal velocity is sufficiently low, around 60 miles per hour, 97 kilometers an hour, that they can actually absorb the shock of the landing. This isn't to say they will absorb the shock without injury or even that some won't die. It's simply that they are more likely to survive the fall than not. This is according to a study done by the Journal of the American Veterinary Medical Association documenting 132 cats falling from an average of 5.5 stories and as high as 32 stories. The latter of which, by the way, being more than enough for them to reach their terminal velocity. So, what was the survival rate for these cats? Well, it was actually 90% when they were brought in for treatment of their various injuries that occurred because of their impact with the unforgiving ground. On that note, of those 132 cats included in the study, about two-thirds required some sort of medical treatment as a result of their fall, and about half of those that required treatment, one-third of the total cats brought in, would have died without medical aid. Now, it should be noted, unlike what many reports based on this study state, this does not imply that cats falling from any height should have a 90% survival rate given proper medical attention. First, the average height was only 5.5 stories, which is insufficient for the cats to reach their terminal velocity. Second, the cats that die on impacts are obviously unlikely to be brought into the veterinary clinic, skewing the sample and the results. On the flip side of that, the cats that land uninjured, and there have been examples of this, are not going to be brought in. How much those factors would affect that 90% rate isn't clear, but while we can't say 90% survival rate, at least we can say that they have a very good survival rate given the circumstances. And there's one fascinating caveat that this study shows related to this point. It turns out the number of injuries a domestic cat has from a long fall actually seems to go down above a certain height, which is about seven stories tall. There are two prevalent hypotheses as to why this is the case. The first, presented by the veterinarians who did the study is that the cats will tend to tense up and arch their backs while they are accelerating. This is similar to how they look when they're feeling threatened. While this form is great for absorbing shortfalls, it turns out to be a poor choice for high-velocity impacts beyond the ripping point of muscles and connective tissues, again, as we outlined in our Falling Without a Parachute video. In addition to this, in the case of cats, this tense and arched form will increase the cat's velocity around 15 or so miles per hour over the normal average terminal velocity for cats in a more spread eagle stance. Once the cats reach their terminal velocity, though, it's thought that they relax and assume that more spread eagle flying squirrel stance, which in turn reduces their overall velocity, puts them in a more relaxed body state, and gives them a larger surface area to absorb the impact. While the study offers no direct visual proof of this happening, the types and locations of injury seen from the cats that would have reached their terminal velocity seem to back up the idea that they did assume this position while falling. An alternative hypothesis is that cats above this height simply die more often or have much more serious injuries and so aren't brought into the veterinary clinic at all. This seems likely enough on the surface. However, again, this doesn't explain why the average number of injuries of the cats brought in, having fallen from 7 to 32 stories, is still less than the average number of injuries per cat brought in, having fallen from anything under that height. For reference here, cats at around 7 stories should reach a velocity of 40 to 45 miles per hour, assuming around 10 feet per story, which is about 5 to 20 miles per hour off their terminal velocity. 
They should also reach their terminal velocity at around 12 to 13 stories. In this study, there were numerous cats that survived falls as high as 32 stories, and there have been recorded instances of cats falling from as high as 26 stories that then walk away with no injuries at all, which means those cats could have been dropped from 5,000 feet and would still have been fine, assuming they landed in the same spot and position. On top of that, the actual known record holder for surviving a free fall without injury is a cat that fell from 46 stories. However, the cat usually isn't credited as the known record holder because it didn't land directly on the ground, but rather landed on a canopy, then bounced off it and landed safely. And speaking of landing on soft things, another thing to note with this study is that the vast majority of the cats brought in likely landed on cement given the nature of the ground around high-rise buildings. So it is hypothesized that the injury rate and severity of injury would go down some amount had they landed on grass-covered grounds or the like, perhaps even reducing the injury significantly. For example, when talking about humans with our terminal velocity of around twice that of a domestic house cat, Professor Ulf Bjorstig of Umeå University notes that you actually need about half a meter or so distance to decelerate to make surviving a fall at least theoretically possible. Every extra centimeter beyond that counts significantly at increasing your odds. So landing on any surface that has some level of give is going to help a lot, particularly in the case of cats, which need even less deceleration. Even something like thorny blackberry bushes are better than nothing. For example, in 2006, professional skydiver Michael Holmes managed to land on a blackberry bush, although not intentionally, when both his main chute and his backup failed to deploy correctly. In his case, he suffered a concussion, a shattered ankle, and a slew of more minor injuries, but was otherwise fine. In another instance, this one in 2015, veteran of over 2,500 skydives, Victoria Silias, managed to survive a fall from about 4,000 feet thanks to the little bit of deceleration buffer provided by a freshly plowed field. Granted, she did suffer broken ribs, a broken hip, fractured some vertebrae in her back, but she did survive. As for her husband, who had intentionally tampered with both her main parachute and reserve so that they wouldn't work and had previously attempted to kill her by creating a gas leak in their house, well, he got to move out of said house and into a prison. And speaking of gravity, yes, I went there. Today's sponsor is Brilliant. Brilliant is a problem-solving based website and app that has a hands-on approach. They've got over 60 interactive courses in maths, science, and computer science, and yes, that includes Newton. You can use Brilliant to achieve your STEM goals one little bit at a time. You'll expand your knowledge of the world through interactive puzzles. Brilliant's courses teach through storytelling, interactive challenges, and problems to solve. Brilliant, as always, are improving their platform, and there's brand new interactive content recently, including updates to their Logic course as well as their course on mathematical fundamentals. Or if you want something completely new, Brilliant is, of course, all about search engines, which will teach you how search engines like Google work behind the scenes, how they find the information you need from billions of websites in just a fraction of a second. Look, Brilliant is a great complement to watching educational videos like this one and will really help you master even complex technical subjects. So if you want to support Today I Found Out and get unlimited access to all of Brilliant's in-depth maths and science courses, head on over to brilliant.org forward slash Today I Found Out to get 20% off their annual premium subscription. And let's get into those bonus facts. Speaking of things you probably didn't know about cats, it turns out they, along with our canine friends, are typically right or left pawed. This is according to two studies, one done at the Ataturk University in Turkey in 1991 and another at the University of Manchester in England in 2006. According to the Ataturk University study, the majority of domestic cats are right pawed, 50%, 10% of them are ambidextrous, and the remaining 40% favor their left paw. Dogs, on the other hand, according to the University of Manchester study, tend to be more evenly split, with around 50% being left pawed and 50% being right pawed, with a statistic insignificant number being ambidextrous. In addition to that, there seems to be a connection between the gender of the animal and which paw is dominant in both cats and dogs. Specifically, female cats and dogs typically will have their right paw be dominant, while males tend to go with the left paw. However, if the animal has been spayed or neutered at an early age, this distinction goes away. Determining if your cat or dog is left or right pawed or ambidextrous isn't as simple as running one test, such as giving them a toy to play with that's just out of their reach, 
reach and seeing which paw they'll reach with. This is because their paw preference is often weakly expressed, unlike with humans. Thus, in order to accurately determine your pet's paw preference, you need to run such tests several dozen times to see the trends. Some helpful tests for dogs and cats can include, if you've taught your dog to shake hands, which paw do they seem to like to use the most. Also, if your dog or cat is playing on its back and you put your hand just out of reach, which paw do they use to reach for your hands? You can also try putting a treat or a toy just outside of their reach, underneath a bookshelf or coffee table, a couch, something like that, and see which paw they typically use to try and reach for the toy. You can also put some peanut butter on the top center of their nose and see which paw they use to get it off. For dogs and cats, if the animal wants inside a room you're in, which paw do they typically use to scratch at the door? Another good one is to put a treat underneath something and see which paw they use first to try and uncover the treat. Yet another test is to place a small piece of paper or plastic on a smooth surface so it can slide and then place a tasty lickable treat on the paper. When the dog or cat licks it, inevitably the paper and plastic will slide and they will likely use one of their paws to stop it from sliding while they lick. In all of these cases, record which paw is used and once you've done several dozen at least of these tests, check to see if there is a clear dominant paw. If not, continue until one emerges. If you've done 100 to 200 or so such tests and there is no noticeable poor preference, well, congratulations, your animal is ambidextrous. That being said, it should be noted that cats, as in all things, tend to be trickier to figure out than dogs. For instance, it's been observed that when cats are playing, they typically don't exhibit much in the way of a poor preference. But when they want something like a treat, it's then that they'll usually use their dominant paw first, unless they are simply one of those 10% or so that are ambidextrous. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, you know what to do. Smash that like button. Don't forget to subscribe. Also, do check out our fantastic sponsor, Brilliant, who are linked to below. And as always, thank you for watching.